And uh, in our continued theme of world domination, I have the wonderful uh, opportunity to introduce Bill Derry to you. Um, I'm going to read quickly his bio and then I'm going to make a comment which I hope does not in any way um, influence negatively his talks. But, uh, so, Bill is the Director of Innovation at the Westport Library in Connecticut. He is the co-chair of the Westport Mini Maker Fair and one of the leaders of the creation of the library's makerspace. Bill is working with several public libraries and school districts to support the creation of makerspaces. Prior to joining the library in 2011, Bill worked in education for over 30 years as an elementary classroom teacher. Drama in education, uh, in drama in education teacher, uh, library media specialist, supervisor of library media K-12 and information technology literacy coordinator K-12, <sighs> and just you know, so if you he wanted me to stop the, the bio there, but this next line is kind of important to me. He was honored in 2011 by the Connecticut Library Association of, or uh, Connecticut Association of School Librarians for significant contributions to the library media field on the local, state, and national levels, and in 2014 received a special achievement award for innovation from the Connecticut Library All Association. Right. Um, I, I think those of you who are here uh, sort of have heard I Lead You as a combination of people and meets on the road. And um, I think this is a, another story. Ann and I were at a, uh, an IMLS event in uh, Kansas City, and Bill was there. And we started talking and realized that yet again, we had found our tribe. And um, what I, I love about this is throughout I Lead USA, we throw away, we throw away. We throw around terms from user and patron and all these things. I throw out member. Today, I very much want to, I, I believe we're going to be introduced to the concept of maker. And what I love about all of the discussions about what we call the public, what we call the communities that we reach out to, what we call our scholars and our students, what we call folks, it has importance, right? What we call them within our local community, that really is a decision and definition of how you work with your community. Do, do they like being called a member or a patron? But what we call the folks that we serve amongst the profession, I think is very, very important. When we use terms such as user, do we mean consumer? Do we mean customer? Do we mean people who come in and passively take and walk away? Even the idea of member that I, I purport, community member, what have you, has this distinction between sort of those who are members and those who aren't. And one of the terms that I think has been real progress and has definitely sparked my thinking, and why I'm really glad that, that Bill's here to spark our thinking, is maker. The notion that libraries help create, foster, develop, push forward, provide community to makers. Whether that is makers of dreams, whether that is makers of 3D prints, whether that is makers of technology, whether that is makers of scholarship, whether that is makers of opportunity. The concept that our communities are alive, those communities of doctors, of lawyers, of scholars, etc., are alive and helping to construct the world around us. And so I am absolutely thrilled because I don't think there's anyone better at introducing those concepts and has done so internationally than Bill Derry. So please. Certainly my honor to be here. I can't believe when I look at what you've been through in Ily for the past nine, nine months and where you are now is talking to someone on the bus and I look forward to seeing some of the presentations today. Um, I'm going to be telling a story. We started in November of 2011 and uh, actually I remember seeing a video from Syracuse University. It was uh, two students, two art students who were working with Fayetteville who had done this incredible video on why making should be a part of the library. And that was very inspirational. Um, I want you to know that there is a, a, the, the PowerPoint's almost exactly the same. Is your in the back? Okay, okay? I can go up to the. Okay. okay. Um, I want to say to everybody out there that's uh, watching on the streaming, if you have a question, make sure you tweet um, hashtag iLeadUSA. And the questions will go to a lot of the people that are sitting down here are going to be reviewing the Twitter feed. And then at the end, we can hopefully answer some of those questions. So 
Uh, David mentioned my background in drama and education. That's going to come up a bit because uh, for many years I worked in that field, which is not putting on plays. It is changing the context of learning, similar to what you're doing in your iLeague. Creating teams, creating groups, and shifting roles so that you start thinking a different way. For example, a drama and education class in a fifth grade that's studying Industrial Revolution would involve creating an assembly line, having Henry Ford come in in role, and have you involved in the whole repetition of the assembly line process. You experience it from the inside. So that is the shift, I think, that's happening on a bigger level, that we are creating participatory learning environments where contexts are being shifted. So I think my drama and end background may have been the most valuable piece for, for this step. So uh, if you go to um, westportlibrary.org slash USA, there is the most current copy of this PowerPoint, which is almost exactly the same as the one you have, just a couple of minor, minor tweaks. And also it leads to, um, it leads to some other resources that I have online for you. Like everything to me is connected, unfortunately. In the last week, I read, oh, spooky action. Did you read about spooky action? Einstein um, did not believe in quantum mechanics that particles that are at a great distance could be connected. He called it spooky action and he didn't want to believe it. Well, they have verified, these scientists in the Netherlands have verified that particles that can be as far away as the distance in the universe can have an immediate impact on the other just through observation. What does that have to do with making? I don't know, but it seems like it has to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it has to. Uh, quantum mechanics, the next computer. Um, all of these things that are, we're on the verge of, this big change that's happening. Because that's what my talk is really about. Change. And really leading change instead of being in, the, in, in a wave and having it roll you over, trying to lead change. And we're going to talk about play and imagination and context. Those are really the four big concepts in this. So I'm going to go over, you all, how many have a makerspace? I'll see, now this is one of my fears when I do this talk is, how, if three years ago, no hands would have gone up. Two years ago, come. Now we're all, we've heard, we've read, we've watched videos. We, how many have been to a maker fair? Okay. Look at that! You know, I remember when I found out a maker fair, about a maker fair, which was, I'll tell you about, about four years ago. So uh, some of you have not, but you will, because they are, again, coming, becoming more and more popular. I like this definition from IMLS, who has had a major impact on our library and on um, It's just broad enough, and, and deals with the digital and the physical, and it fosters experimentation and invention, and it's about play and imagination and thinking and project-based learning, which is what you're doing when you present today, right? But I don't want to forget that the maker movement comes from a different area than hands-on learning. Now, in 1971, when I had my first classroom, I had interest centers. And I had, uh, I had a digital, well, as digital as you could get in 1971, I had Claymation Center with Super 8. Oh, wow. Super 8. So the kids were making movies with Super 8. And we did a lot of movie making. This is not the same. Things have drastically changed. The tools that we have now, like the Arduino, and I saw on your, on your table, on the zoo, um, petting zoo table, the Oculus Rift, things that we have now go so far beyond and are at such a low cost that everyone can learn more efficiently and better. If I learned science with an Arduino, I think I would have understood a lot of how things work, but I didn't, but now it's available. Yes. I can sit here if you want. Just okay. the slides. Okay. Just in case. I'm sorry. Okay. So it'll be a video later, and I can go down and do it. Or whatever you need. Okay. <laughs> um, so how many have seen the iFixit kits? Okay. Well, you find them at a, at a maker fair. Uh, there are groups that say, why are we held hostage to corporations? We buy something for hundreds of dollars, even if it's $50, who cares, we bought it, it should be ours, why can't we get into it and fix it? And even if we can get into it, we don't even know what, know what to do with it. 
But that's not true. The way learning has changed with YouTube, you can learn how to do it. You can fix that screen on your iPhone. And with these little break-in kits, which of course your warranty is now no longer valid, but um, <laughs> you know, when you get into this world, you don't care about warranties. You care about being able to manage and um, fix without spending a lot of money so things don't just get thrown away. The maker movement is about not throwing things away, but repairing them, fixing them, and having the ability within your community, not necessarily you, but within your community, to fix it. Now, they have a re uh, in New York City, they have a fix-it group, like a library, where you bring things and volunteers fix things for you. And I think the library is a place where we'd like to start that, it's capacity and getting the people that can do it, but that's a great program. And of course, we've seen this for how long, the way things work. Um, and kids, DK books, things that take you inside, right? Now, we are able to really um, understand a little better about how things work. So this takes me back to the change process. Remember I said we're going to look a little bit at change? And I don't know if you've ever thought about what is it, when things start changing, why do some people see the change before others? Like when we moved from the horse to the car, I know there were people in that street who had a horse at home who said, It'll never, this, these automobiles will never be here for long. <laughs> and the, the process, you know, from gas to electrici electricity, this one, you know, this was a huge one. And, and of course, just think of the next, you know, the iteration that many people are working on, that other car catalog, that other catalog that will deal with humans and, and uh, resources and connecting people. That's the one that's actually being created now. And classrooms have changed. Going into your room this morning, I mean, that's, you know, the group work. Uh, it, ha it took a while, a lot longer than anyone uh, expected. But now with technology, there are clusters and collaboration is much more common. So David says this, and, the, you know, are we, is it the collection development to connection development? Is that the big change in making? Is it from going from transactions to transformations? Is that the big change? If it is, how do we measure, how do we get the stories of transformation into a report? You know, it's so easy to use quantitative data. It's so hard to get people to listen to the transformation data. Uh, because it has to be in a, in a either narrative or it has to be in a, in a video form or a podcast. It takes a little more time to get the transformation. Like this boy uh, with his monkey shirt. He came into our library and we, we had one little 3D printer and he looked at everybody around it and he said, I don't know why you're using that thing verse. And we looked at him and he said, you know, you really should be designing. Now this is way back at the beginning. And he, I said, oh, what do you know how to use? And he goes, well, I can use SketchUp really well. I said, how did you learn it? And he's near the MakerBot store in Brooklyn. And um, they sent people into the schools to teach SketchUp. So he proceeded to teach adults for that summer while he was visiting his grandmother, how to use SketchUp. And it was, you know, we all know it's not about age, it's about experience, but when you actually see it in action, when you see an eight-year-old teaching an eight-year-old, you, you realize it is about experience. And it's two ways, but he had something to really give in this situation. Um, we started with a, uh, a, a an airplane making project with industrial arts and power tools and a, a grandmother, we call it the 8 to 88 project because grandparents brought their grandchildren to spend hours in the makerspace sanding and sawing uh, for this, these airplanes that were being built. And one grandmother stood outside and she had sent her two, daughter, her two granddaughters in and she goes, I'm going in. <laughs> and she went in and for the first time in her life she used a router and a sander. And she came out and she said, you know, I come to this library and I take out books. This is the first time I've come here and actually learned. That's the first time she touched power tools. It was a transformative moment for her. You could just see it in her body. And um, that's the kind of uh, intergenerational moments in making are really uh, unusual. Because if we had tried to put this maker space in the children's department, it would have bombed. There are too many necessary rules in the children's department in terms of security issues, in terms of parent, parental and safety issues. But we put it in the main hall of our library when, when you walk in, and it becomes very intergenerational. It, it did attract more teens and young people, but 
Overall, it's about 70% under 18 and 30% over 18. This was an amazing statistic to me. I, this whole Generation Z, 25% of our population is under 19. Unbelievable. I guess that makes some sense, but I thought that was really skewed to the other end. And they are, of course, determining what to market to this group. What is it that they like? What do they do? Well, 76% wish their hobbies would turn into full-time jobs. And 80% believe they are more driven than their peers, and 72% want to start their own business. Now, how many of you have accelerators or startup uh, businesses in your communities? We have a couple in Connecticut. They are being invaded by young people, high school, college, who want to skip the whole going to school process and take their invention to market and become, you know, Shark Tank has had a big impact. And they can't handle the people that are coming to them. Now, this is great for libraries because not that we can necessarily handle them any better, but we are learning how to provide more assistance in how to take an idea to market. And it's not just like little programs anymore. It's creating teams, makers, who create relationships, who pass on resources, who share with one another. I think this Generation Z with the five screens versus two screens is a surprise. It's not a surprise that they're more visual than any other, um, like the millennials, even though I can't imagine getting much more visual in my learning than, um, but five screens rather than two screens. And realist versus optimist, and they want to work for success uh, rather than wanting to be discovered. So all of these changes are, are out there, as well as we know we're moving from a service, or at least we're trying to move from a service consumption culture to a production. Now, a library moving to production, that's what, and people appear, apparently they want it. And I'll tell you how we found out our community wanted it. Um, they, um, this whole one-room schoolhouse idea, this came from John Seely Brown, who I'll tell you about in a second, but we're back to a one-room schoolhouse. We have this company called Level Up Village. They, you pay, for, it's an after school, but we did it in the library. And you get a 3D printer, and they send a 3D printer to a group in a developing country. So we were dealing with a, a classroom in Nicaragua over the summer. They got a 3D printer, we had a 3D printer, we had 12 kids. Now we have to come up with a problem to solve on both sides. The problem was they lose electricity a lot. And if they had a solar powered flashlight, it would be very helpful. So we got a solar powered kit, they built a solar powered kit. Uh oh, it didn't come with a case. Can you design a case and print it on the 3D printer? Now we had Skype, we had translators, and over the five days, they developed different cases. Now you can only imagine how many different kinds of cases you can build for, for one little solar kit. Many, but some are more efficient and work better than others and are less expensive to make. So the learning process in this, besides it being a global connection, it is just incredibly big and deep. So these are the changes that I've noticed coming from school library to public library. Um, that, you know, it used to be li library centric, now it's learning centric. The magazines that we used to get, they, they are now, they, they don't even have a library in the title, a lot of them. They're about knowledge and learning. And language literacy is now, <laughs> come on. I mean, the New York Times has coding, as reading, writing, arithmetic, and coding. Now, coding, we advertise a coding workshop at our library. It is filled overnight. We can't keep up with JavaScript and Python and all of the different languages as well as the, the different levels of people. We take advantage of Khan Academy. We take advantage of Code Academy. Anything online which gives us that teacher and we can become a coach. So this is one of the strategies that I say for libraries. You can't, you're not going to become a JavaScript coder. You're going to have to either pull in the experts in the community. I'm going to talk about surrogate librarians. We have so many surrogate librarians. Once they're at a certain level, ding, you're, you're up here and, and they work with us. We just did a Pecha Kucha. How many know Pecha Kucha? Pecha Kuchas are like TEDx's, only they deal with personal passion. And you can't get a license for your library. You have to get a license for your community. So we got a Westport, the town of Westport license. 
and you, you should do it where there's alcohol. That's, <laughs> that, that's where they, they say, you know, do it up. So we, we uh, made a relationship with a Japanese restaurant across the street. And we had our first Pecha Kucha um, just about three weeks ago. People tell stories of personal passion. One told the story of the night a sloth exploded when they were in Costa Rica. Uh, it, one, we have our technology guy at work. He's interested in refinishing furniture. And he's from Ghana. And he talked about how this certain line of American um, furniture resembles or seems to be based on architecture and design in Ghana. It was his personal passion. It, it just brings people out in a new way. So I have a surrogate community member who is, without her, we would not have had a Pecha Kucha. And I could go through like loads of people who have come in who have become surrogate librarians. Really important. Um, content, for, content versus context. This is a, an interesting shift. It does go to answers and questions. I mean, core reference librarians, right? How many reference librarians? Yeah, it's, you know, the shift is dramatic. It's more about how do we help people get the right questions now? Because you could have the wrong question and spend forever on a topic. So you're trying to find out what they really want and trying to broaden that question to make it a better question is more important now than the answers. So that's a big shift. Um, the context is where making comes in. Because by putting a makerspace smack dab, it looks like in The Wizard of Oz where the house falls on the witch. Ours is like smack dab in the middle of the Great Hall. Boom! You cannot miss it when you walk in. And it changes the context immediately, symbolically, of what a library is. And I had an interesting, this is a transformational story, I think. I had a woman who really hated this makerspace. She hated the noise. She didn't think it was appropriate to be in the library. You know, people wrote, wrote things um, in our suggestion box. When are you putting bungee jumping in the library? <laughs> when are you putting um, pools, wading pools? So there were some people who didn't like it, especially as it came out of the reference. It was formerly books that were referenced. So they thought that we were desecrating the library and pulling off all the important books. She came up to me three weeks ago and said, I want to apologize. I have seen the value of this makerspace with the people that you have drawn. And it was like, ugh, one of those things where when you're down your backbone, you get that chill, like, it, it just, she saw it. And it takes time for some people to see that you're not throwing away the baby with the bathwater. There are still people that you need to uh, meet the needs of who are traditional users. But we're changing. We need to meet the needs of community users who aren't even in the library. And that's what the makerspace does. It pulls in people. We, we go out into the community and put up a makerspace booth. So we have the Blues, Views, and Barbecue Festival. And we go out with our makerspace and we have a table. We have met entrepreneurs who have, who have developed products in our makerspace. I didn't even know we had a, um, a 3D printer. We just did this in September. We could not believe, after almost four years of having a makerspace, that were people, families, that did not know that we had a makerspace. So it, it's just, they're, if they're not coming to the library, they're not coming. And they don't know what you have. Uh, the whole no child, oh, what about that? Isn't that interesting what's happening with um, uh, President Obama recognizing that testing is a real problem? I mean, to hear it from Arne Duncan, to hear it from there, this is absolutely incredible. Um, and we're hope, hopeful that it will make a change. Because here, they want the schools to do coding? Yeah. When? Which one? How? What, how do you squeeze it in? They want them to do science. Now, I taught for 30 years. Science was always an afterthought. Always. You know, if you could get that science in after, and social studies was the, the afterthought right before science. Because you were reading, writing, arithmetic. And then social studies maybe, and science, eh, possibly. Well, with, with this, the new maker movement, has, it's, it's really more integrated. So when you're doing Tinkercad, or you're doing design, or you're doing this Nicaragua project, it's more about how people live. You've got your social studies, you've got your math, you've got your science, you've got your... It's the, in that case, it's an old-fashioned thing because it's an integrated lesson. It's got technology and people and relationships all in it. It's still hard to fit in, but it does make sense when people try it and see it in action. So where did the... This new culture of learning by John Seely Brown. I was at an internet librarian's workshop in Monterey in November, October of 2011, when he, he said, 
You know, you librarians, I think, you think that we're in the information age. And people nodded, and he goes, that's long gone. We're in the imagination age. We need to help people do something with all of this information that they can get, and learn something. An interesting point that he made, and I still have struggled with this, but I think I have it at least in my own head, the difference between creativity and imagination. And the simple di difference is that with imagination, you visualize the outcome. So Elon Musk, for example, who was born with that gift, um, if you can picture something at a higher level, you're going to make it at a higher level. If you, your imagination is developed more, you're going to produce more efficiently, effectively, and at a higher level. And so how to get Im people's imagination developed is different than creativity, which is we all have creativity. That's what you use to put that vision into place. So imagination is more focused on vision. Then he said, I think this maker movement is something for libraries, and this make magazine. And he talked about Dale Doherty, who I, I just met at, um, at the House of Representatives. Uh, because they had a congressional caucus on making. So everyone's getting involved in this. And the Make Magazine, he said, everybody should have this, everyone should use this. He said, this Maker Faire thing looks really big. I saw in, um, it's, this is the Bay, 2006 was the first Maker Faire. Not even 10 years ago was the first Maker Faire. And he talked about why libraries should get involved in this making. Now, unfortunately, my story is no longer, it used to be a linear story, but with all these years and all this time, it, it's no longer linear. We've now on our, we just did our fourth Maker Fair, and I will tell you that without a Maker Fair, we would never have gotten into the making um, business um, as fast as we did, I don't think, because we accidentally did a community needs assessment. <laughs> you know how long they can take? They can take forever to get foot, and now, unfortunately, most people have to do them. Um, but we accidentally had a person who's on the Board of Education who came to the library in January of 2012 and said, can I use a room in your library I would like to put on a Maker Faire? And we talked about it, because we had already been thinking about this, and we said, no, which we never do. You can use the whole library if we can partner with you. One of the best decisions that we ever made, because number one, He's been raising the money. So it takes about $35,000, because we do the ours for free, to, to put on a Maker Faire. We have different pricing structures. You can do one for $4,000. You can do one for $10,000. We did a $30,000, because we put up a huge tent outside, uh, and we use inside the library and outside the library. But with this Maker Faire, everything changed. We thought 800 would come to the first, 2,200 came. And on our fourth, we had 6,500. The fifth one is um, next year, April 30th, and they were expecting 10,000. Um, it's, it's, it's in the top 10% of many fairs, uh, many maker fairs in the world. Um, and it just, it just attracts people. So after we did our first one, they, people said, what are you going to do now? What are you, you going to do? We want, we want to be inspired. We want to learn how to make. We want to... Well, we said, and we had our director at the time, um, Maxine Blywise, was very forward thinking, said, let's do a maker space right there. And when we took those shelves down, five shelving units that were referenced, let's put it right there. So that's where it went. Now, um, John Seely Brown said the reason libraries need to get into maker fairs or maker, the maker movement is because, now most of you aren't, a lot of you aren't going to remember this, but not very long ago, you could learn a new technology. <laughs> and you could rest on your laurel. You could say, okay, okay, I, I can go on my little plateau. I'm, I'm okay. I learned it. I can not have to learn something for a little while. When is the last time that was possible? There are five things that we're not learning right now that we know we should know. Right? <laughs> They're on our cell phones. Someone says, I'm dropping it. It's like, the, this is what he said. The, our culture is, rapid change is causing anxiety because no one can keep up. But if Libraries get into playing and tinkering and making, you create an artificial plateau. And you think about it, what's your hobby, right? And what do we love to do? We go into a zone. It's a little bit like meditation, um, and, which is another form. But play, tinker, you watch people. You watch people go into it. 
zoom, they sink in. They flow. And flow and play, that's sort of what play is. It's just a steady flow. So let me just uh, show you a little bit of our Maker Faire. It's a few minutes of a video from last year's Maker Faire. Give you a sense. How many have said they went to a Maker Faire? Okay, this, this is what, we have a couple of videos that were made. And uh, this is a fun one. This gives you an idea. creating like scaffolding for multiple literacies, not just reading, and making it possible to connect to human resources as well as technology resources and whatever you need to make whatever it is your idea is work. One thing we did first, because you can't do this alone, I think if more than anything else, this whole making thing has to have a team. And um, we, we did making workshops with staff. So nothing says you're not in Kansas anymore than a group of librarians soldering. Okay? And, you know, why are we soldering? Why, why are we soldering? Luckily, our group wasn't like that. They really just threw themselves into this. And, I mean, it's a fundamental making skill. You know, not everything needs to be soldered. You could bypass soldering, but why not learn how to do it? And so we did some simple soldering. We did um, 
We did workshops for the community where the staff, after they made, made with the community. So we, did, we had a, a Westport Reads book dealing with Amelia Earhart. And so we did paper airplanes and contests seeing how far our planes could fly. We added play to our monthly report so that people could consider what is the difference between play and work and when do I add play. We have a fun meter that I normally wear. Um, and the fun meter allows you to determine, to show whether you're having fun or not. Now, granted, we can't have fun all the time. But if you, it's sort of like the Eskimos word for snow. There's 50 of them. There are lots of words for fun. And if you explore the meaning of fun and what you do, it's, it's a lot better if you're having fun when you're working than you're not. So you need to expand the definition so that it's got some passion in it, I think. So, you know, it requires receptivity. You've got to look at your team. This was our director. She was totally for it. We have a new director. He is completely on board. He's from Chelsea, Michigan. Um, we have a team from all the departments of the library. And that was our team three years ago. We lost eight of those people through retirement. Um, actually, uh, full disclosure, I'm retiring on Friday, so I will be, I will be out of this picture as of this Friday. Um, but this is not the end of the team. We have this community team. We have 27 volunteers a week in our makerspace from ages 8 through 65. Um, they are part of the team. We have a, an IMLS advisory committee, which is made up from the community, and they provide so much in terms of recommendation. They come to all the events. They suggest, like our blog came out of their recommendation and many other things. Big question here. Now, Dale Doherty says we are all makers. When we got our team together, we had to decide for Westport, what was our makerspace going to focus on? And wow, it was all over the place. Because if you use this definition, it is all over the place. If we are all makers, then videography, writing, what is it? Watercolor, web design, of course it is, right? It's all making. Then how do you differentiate from life if everything is? So here's what we did. We decided we need to come up with a little system, at least to start, at least to start. And we came up with a bullseye, and we came up with where we wanted to focus are making in the beginning. So the outer circle is creative arts. And to me, creative arts is the basis of everything. <laughs> it just, I mean, that's, that's where it came from. Um, but that's the big circle. And then you have your industrial arts, where you started with the tools. And we began our projects with industrial arts making these airplanes. Then you have innovation, inventors, but not necessarily with technology. And this is where, if I had my metal tie that you can't see right now, and I wear sometimes, I take a coin out of my uh, pocket and I will play my metal tie and sing a little song and play the tie. And people, it's a surprise because your tie is not usually an instrument. <laughs> and so that is where number two is. It's a surprise. It's, okay, create a pair of shoes that makes you smarter. Right? And that, you juxtapose two different things and try to solve the problem. That's where two is. And then, the center, the one that I said, look, this, this whole economic development piece, it's the technology is changing how entrepreneurs can, can work and what they can create for hardly any money. They can create a prototype. So let's focus on in inventing with technology as our center. Not that we won't do the rest, but let's make that our place to start. And so we did. And I'll tell you how we, we broadened a little bit um, from that. We moved out. But we still use that as our focus. So making is a reaction against people controlling your products. Like on my cell phone, maybe some of you have had this experience. How many have traveled and wanted to use your phone when you went overseas? Yeah. How many had an easy go of it? No. I, want, I was going to Australia this year. I wanted to just land and use. <laughs> Is that too much to ask uh, from a phone? It just seems like people come to our country, they land and use. Right? Why can't we land and use? So Sprint said, no problem. We have plans. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Can you give me a plan? Well, we're, we're just in the process of changing the plans. 
Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. After four calls and the week before, the lady I get, a new lady, says, Sir, would you like me to unlock your phone? And I, I that's the first time anybody asked me that question. I said, unlock my phone? What do you mean? She goes, well, if I unlock your phone, then you can put any Sims card in there you want. And I said, that's exactly what I want. <laughs> and so I said, how long will it take? She goes, turn your phone on. Turn your phone on. It's a lot. <laughs> so I get to Australia. I go to a 7-Eleven, and I buy a $30. I didn't need to spend that much, I found out, because I only used, in 17 days, I used only $12 calling Europe, America, all of Australia. And I put that little SIM card in my phone. And now my phone can be anything. It's, it's, it's an open phone, not a closed phone. Well, that's the whole idea of the maker movement. It, it's open source. It's, it, not everything can be, but the movement is towards sharing and making it easy to fix, repair, and use things. But you have to know. Now I know it's a lot easier for me <laughs> to use my phone overseas. Um, this is our, our airplane. We have these two planes that fly. This project was so great because it was linked to the flight of the imagination. So we were, we were focusing on imagination. There are these two planes. This guy, Joseph Schott, he's a wonderful architect, engineer, and of course there's a little bit of a story that I have to tell you behind it. When I taught um, at Greens Farms Elementary School as a library media specialist, I'm also a justice of the peace and a minister in the Universal Life Church, and I married my, the gifted teacher and happened to marry her to him. And so he didn't reappear until he was sitting on the floor after the Maker Fair, right in the middle of the Great Hall, and I go, Joseph, what are you doing? This place calls for airplanes. I said, what? He goes, this, this hall looks like an airplane hangar. It should have airplanes. And he has sketched, literally, he sketched what ended up happening. And there is the power of imagination. He had a vision that he could immediately get over to us. We knew what he was talking about. And we just had to supply the space. And then we got some funders. Because the first year of our makerspace, we had no funding at all. So we ran the makerspace for one year. And um, we got donations from Rings End. They gave us all the supplies for that makerspace, which was designed around Wilbur, Wilbur and Orville Wright's barn. It's got that kind of classic shape, but it has that industrial kind of futuristic look. It was his this, um, idea to use those pipes, but it really gave it a feel, I think. Um, he, those planes were GBs, yeah. Granville Brothers, racing planes. Did I know? We got more people in aviation in the library. It's incredible. They never would have come into the library. These guys that had flown, they come in to, to work on and see these planes. So there's, there's our makerspace, and there's an expansion on the outside called Innovation Stations, which we've since changed. I'll tell you about that. Um, there, it's a terrible use of space. We're trying to redesign this library. It's beautiful to look at, but we need space. That whole, set, that whole floor could be another floor for us to use, and, and it's being used for beauty, but it's not functional. So they're, they're looking at trying to make it. Now, I know some of you say, I, I can't do this. I don't even have a space. Well, it's not about maker spaces. Now, uh, Erica Compton in Idaho, who has an IMLS grant, who's been putting, she's, got, uh, she's on the road to all the libraries in Idaho helping with their maker spaces. And they have spaces that are so country small, there isn't room for a postage stamp. So. She reminds people, it's not about maker spaces, it's about makers. Mm -hmm. And David's, you see, here's, I could be doing um, fairy tales and learning. I could be doing a global warming. Event. But the beauty of the maker movement is it comes with attitudes of lifelong learning, of perseverance, of flexible thinking. 21st century skills are all wrapped up in this maker movement. And it's, it's just a great place to go because you learn so much in the process. Even though it's, it's not, it's a symbol, it's a symbol. There are lots of other ways to apply what you learn. But the makerspace gives you insight into the attitude of an inventor, an entrepreneur, a maker, and a player. So remember that when you own, it could be pop-up, it could be on a cart. It, it can start very small. And this is the Institute of Museum and Library Services moment because we thought, let's, let's apply for this National Leadership Grant. I doubt we'll get it. We're a very uh, economically robust community and 
Probably they won't, but you know what? If we write it, we'll get, we'll understand our objectives and where we're going. So we did and we got it and we were shocked and we were so, we didn't even know what we were getting ourselves into other than we rapidly, we rapidly attracted people. And that was probably the best. We got interns from our local university and they stayed for two years because our grant was a one year grant but it got extended to two years. And we were lucky to have consistency in the same people. They were only 19 hours a week each, so we had 40 hours. We had all kinds of maker workshops. We had, uh, and I think this is really an interesting way for you to consider your makers, not an artist in res residence, a maker in residence. Right? Uh, and it can be so diverse, I'll show you ours. Um, and then we developed this idea for design thinking stations. And this was one of our success failures because it was a success, except can't use it. So it was a failure. So we are retooling it, retooling it. But I mean, I think we're, we're probably not proud of our, of our failure because, you know, at the end of a grant, often you don't say, well, this didn't work. Well, this didn't work the way we proposed, but it is working now in a different way. So here's our monthly maker in residence. And Balam Soto, um, he is, in all maker fairs, he goes to San Francisco. He is an artist who uses technology to develop new forms. Like you're going to be working on making instruments soon. He creates plexiglass, Arduino-based instruments that are synthesizers with all kinds of levels. Like a musician can play it really at a different level than anybody can walk up to and play. We had collaborative art. Gar Waterman, he, he did a pop-up office space that we have sitting out. It, it folds into one little tiny wall on wheels, and then you pull it out and you've got a full office space. Ed Kalen, an all-sky camera, you can put it on your, on, your, um, seal, on your roof, and you can record um, migration of birds, you can record, you can set it for different ways of recording. And it's made with a Raspberry Pi, which is a $35 full computer. And we have our, our Norwalk Woodworkers Guild did a virtual making. They built the furniture for our extension in their shop while we had their video shown. You could watch them building in the shop all hours of day and night because they were virtually in the library. We had design thinking stations. Josh Berker, um, he is amazing and um, I'll tell you more about him. And then with Joseph Shop and the refinery, this was, we went to the edge on this one. These two women started a group for women, uh, women entrepreneurs who already had a product. So you had to have something that was already bringing in $500,000. So it wasn't like another lady that we had who invented a headband. She's a secretary who came into the library and, and she actually ended up with a product and a headband that she got um, mass produced in China and is she selling in our store and online. This, these are products that are already out there. So they became our last maker in residence to look at how can we learn about angel investing? Things that we only had a cursory knowledge of patent, trademark. They brought in resources that we had not used. <coughs> we learned about all these great resources. They are now in their fourth iteration. Uh, a product they just had um, is, was on Good Morning America last week, um, Preg Prep um, for women who want to get pregnant. It's now available in all stores. Uh, it's very inexpensive, but it, it, they did the first level of angel investing and going up one notch in their marketing um, at the refinery. So that was like breaking the mold. That was a very different maker and residence for us. Now this, I love this one, because it was our first maker and residence. And just look at it. If you look at the bullseye, if you look at the bullseye, it's got creative arts. It's traditional. It's a quilt. You can't get any more traditional. Each one of those little squares is a personal story, right? Well, then they sewed them together. And they got Lily Pad Arduino and programmed it to have lights, digital lights, throughout. Originally, you would touch a, a little base in the library. It was remote control activated. So it was off until you touched the remote, and then it would go on. The story is, we are now, we used to have stories that were isolated. We're now digitally and socially connected through all kinds of technology. So our stories don't have to be alone. They can be connected. And you see the libraries imagine. We have our imagine square in the not quite middle, but um, and this woman 
the 0101 chance of a 3D printer at home, and she did love in binary on her square. So each one has a story, but I just love the idea that we went through each of the bulls, uh, the bullseye, each one of the areas, because on the back is a wooden frame, which we call industrial arts. And so we got all of our four levels into this project, and it's now blinking away in the library. So. Because of my background in school, I've been working with a lot of schools on how does this work in a school library. It's got a lot of differences, but it's got a lot of similarities. And the, the big similarity is, how do we manage it? How do you manage it? And that's really the first layer of, that people get hit with, I think, when they hear, who's going to do it? How do we manage it? And does it have to be 3D printers? And if so, I don't have a clue how to use that. Or does it? Or Arduino, or a Raspberry Pi, or you know, Oculus Rift. Just fill in the blank. Anything that's disruptive that's out there. So um, basically, we talk about building a team, um, and then finding some kids that will help you. But this is my graphic on my learning about the difference between the school library and the public library. Now. As a school librarian, I tried to collaborate with the public library very often. And we got close. We cooperated. We coordinated. And those are usually the, the two C's that people think is collaboration. But collaboration was, I would say, an impossibility. And I didn't know why. Not for sure. But now I do. It's so clear. Schools are closed systems. They the. The old meaning of collaboration, which is treason, and that wasn't that long ago, is the current meaning of collaboration <laughs> in the schools. You cannot bring in outside. It's, it's, it's got to go through too much to make it possible. You cannot connect. The curriculum is gospel. To go off the curriculum by adding the library, you're, where are the goals and objectives that are in our curriculum? It's too complicated. If all fourth grade teachers are doing the same thing, which unfortunately is often the case, then one fourth grade teacher cannot collaborate with you because they'd be doing something different. So this open system of the library means we only survive on the outside. That's, uh, that, the outs if without the outside, there's no, there's no public library. So I have learned that the makerspace is a bridge by accident, our two middle schools in town, we found out, put up a sign that said, if you would like to use the 3D printers at school, you must get trained at the library. <laughs> what? <laughs> if we had dreamed that up, it would not have happened. Why did it happen? It happened because of the movement from the library into the schools where the kids would say, yeah, I, I learned that at the library. And then finally, the teachers thought, we have, we have people who are trained. They can use it. So it, it, this is an opportunity for kids to come and use tools that close down at their school. This is why video, we, we, have, we have television studios in all of our schools. I started one in my elementary school, and now all schools have a television studio. They can't use the studio after 3 o'clock. We need to have a studio. We don't have it yet. But the capabilities of those kids coming Again, they can teach our, the rest of the community. And there are many in the community that know a video already. You can teach them higher level skills. So these, we're finding these connections between schools and library. And they aren't, I mean, yes, there's homework help. Yes, there's reading lists. Yes, but that hasn't done much except for that specific group. This opens up what you can do with these kids. And it makes them part of a club. This whole membership is pretty amazing. Just like you and your iLead have teams where you know each other so well. I mean, we know this works, but how do we create it in schools? And libraries can help by creating a space where they can use this, these tools after school. OK, the whole open source, we know. I mean, this is just an example that you all know. But um, how many know how Mongo? OK, this is, is a system for identifying who can help you in your library as a maker. This was done, Mimi Ito, the Japanese archaeologist who worked with the Chicago uh, Umedia Lab, developed this system. If you look it up now, it's got dissertations. People have done dissertations on Homago. But Homago is 
First, teens hang out. H-O, hanging out. And guess what? It's not just teens. We do the exact same thing. Then, they mess around. Mess around. And now the next one is the good one. I mean, they're all good, but this one is where you've got somebody on your team. You've got a surrogate librarian geeking out. When they get to the geek out, they are demonstrating their skill set, their passion, their interests. These are the people who fix your printers. These are the people who come up with new ideas. We've got 3D printers being built in our library right now because somebody donated these uh, cobble bots that were from Kickstarter. There's a team. We, you get teams developed, so they, they put it together. You don't have to worry about what to do with equipment. Um, you have people there who know how to, how to manage it. Now, David Lurcher, who's a friend of mine, but also he's a professor at San Jose University, and he came to the New York Maker Fair with Leslie Prey, who is, has a maker space in Indiana. It's a middle school maker space. She wrote a book on maker spaces in school libraries. And we went to the Maker Fair and came home and said, you know, there might be a, a more educational uh, way than Homaga that schools would like better. So we created this system, and again, it's just, it's available. You can download it and print it out right there. Um, and, and if you download the PowerPoint, you can get that link. But this is great to point out to someone when they come in the Maker Space and they come in with SketchUp and they start designing. Look at you, you're experimenting. You are actually repurposing that old tool. You can use the language on this chart that is connected to the common core, but looking at dispositions. And you can move people towards creating, away from intellectual property misuse, <laughs> toward actual developing, making things themselves, designing. And it's, it's, wor it's actually working because schools are teaching on Tinkercad and SketchUp more now. So kids are coming with these tools already. But this is a, a useful tool. So one group came in and they were called MITs and I said, you're MITs? MITs? What does that mean? Makers in training. Uh -huh. So makers in training is a great uh, term for people who are just starting out and coming in and we're all makers in training. I mean, it, it, I had to retrain for today to do the makey makey just to remember the levels. There's so many levels. So you have to go back and try it again and learn something new. Um, we worked with the schools to, to look at our goals, to see how they linked up with the school goals. They have engineering teachers now in the schools. So they're moving very rapidly towards adding more design and 3D printing in the schools. Safety is an issue. We have liabilities. We talk to our insurance company. Uh, everyone signs a waiver when they use the makerspace. We have not had any um, accidents yet but we certainly expect accidents. How could you, you know, uh, th there's that school in, in San Francisco uh, that uh, Scully, what's his name? Uh, uh, he did a YouTube talk, but he believes that kids should do dangerous things. That he had a camp and parents had to sign a form that said your child might die here at this camp this summer. They had to sign it because they used power tools. I visited it when I was out of ALA this summer in San Francisco and the kids were sawing, but they learned how to do it. They were 10-year-olds, um, 11-year-olds using adult power tools. So more and more, and that's hard in the children's department of the library. That's why having your makerspace in the in a team section or outside is better. So all of these disruptive technologies are coming along. That's why we, we got the Oculus Rift. What is more disruptive than the Oculus Rift? How, how many have used it? Yeah, I mean, and we only see, I was telling David earlier, we had a PTC CREA workshop at the library on CAD design. I didn't even know what PTC CREA was, but this guy comes in and says, I can teach PTC CREA for you. Okay. <laughs> and then we, we put out a registration, you know, we vetted him, he was an incredible kid, a junior in college, and he attracted five people. One of them was a local realtor, realtor who was an animator before that. And she says, I'm using Matterport. What? Matterport, it's a camera that realtors use to transform the inside of their houses into um, three-dimensional and they can put them on the web. But there is a link with the Oculus Rift. Would you mind if we sent our clients to you to walk through the house on the Oculus Rift? 
So we are now are doing our first work to link to a, like a real world application. I, I want the developers kit so that we can start teaching people how to create something for the Oculus Rift. But in the interim, there are products out there that use it. I think that's really interesting. So here's some books that we've used. Um, I told you about um, Josh Berger. This is a really good beginner's book. It has Makey Makey, tur Turtle Art, uh, the Classroom Technology Projects. It's a, a really applicable for public libraries. And Leslie Preddy, she's the one who started the Makerspace in the middle school. These books are great for libraries, these school books, because they've got some good ideas. The Tinkerers is a wonderful book. One of our Westport residents, Alec Foge, um, wrote that book. And it really shows you how, in the beginning of our, of our country, presidents and people were tinkerers. People were prototyping. And we sort of lost it. And this is what the maker movement is trying to bring back. Let's invent. Let's prototype. Let's have an idea and see where we can take it. But this is a good selection. Now, people say, is it about 3D printers? And I say, no, it's not about 3D printers. Then why do you have 11 3D printers? Um, well, I'll tell you why we have 11 3D printers. Because people love them. And we have been able to handle them. I would not recommend that anybody go with 11 3D printers. And of course, which 3D printer do you buy? It's so hard. But Make Magazine makes it easier. They recommend three. And right now, they have three uh, printers that they're recommending. And this one in the middle is $5.99. Printer bot, simple metal. Very reliable and relatively inexpensive. Our favorite printer, but way too expensive, is this one up on the right. It's Stratasys that bought, a, they bought MakerBot. And um, Stratasys, this U-Print, does prototypes at a high level. We charge $10 a cubic inch to cover cost on that machine. But it does the most beautiful two plastic prints, and then you take it and you put it into a tank and where are you going to put a tank? We don't have space for a tank. We don't even have running water in our makerspace. So we had to go into the boiler room and make what we call the makerspace annex <laughs> in the boiler room. And in the boiler room is our big tank, and that's where we take all of the prototypes, and they spend about 10 hours at a lot of temperature and a lot of whirling, and they come out beautiful. It is the best printer. If you have entrepreneurs in your community that want to save money, and get the expertise of local people because they get advice from all kinds of people in our makerspace on how to design. That's the beauty of the relationships that are developed in this club. You find people who know how to do what you want to do and you get the information from them. We have robots. Um, and we, we really, we were lucky because we had some uh, community members who gave us $25,000 to buy two of these now robots on the right. Um, they are, the reason, like, who needs $25,000 robots? You can do Hummingbird, you can do Sphero, you, do, you don't need these. What they have in a disruptive way is their humanoid. Humanoid, they could be the stupidest things, and they're not that smart, really, compared to some simpler mechanical robots. But because they walk, and because they have hip movement, and they really, they can do Tai Chi, they can do, they, they, you just are in awe at what they can do. So what does that make you want to do? Learn how they work. Mm -hmm. And how do they work? They work with Python. Mm -hmm. Very complicated. But they have an intermediary software called um, Choreograph. And with Choreograph, anybody can get them to, to tell a story. So we do a workshop series on how to make robots tell stories and dance and add audio to them. We do a lot of Lego. We, have, we, we should have stock in Lego. We have, we have the story starters are fantastic for the young ones. And they, they have an iPad um, connection to them. Um, the, the, all of the We Do series. Ah, the We Do series. See, everybody is making them so that they talk to scratch. And they have inputs and outputs now that you program. So now, the more diff the different programs can communicate with one another, the easier it is to create what you visualize. So I, I'm not going to show you the robot video right now, but um, yeah, so is that a, has anyone seen the now robots? OK, you can go online and you can, you can look them up. But these are all the things that we use. Squishy circuits for little ones, um, Minecraft and Printcraft. Printcraft? You can make stuff in Minecraft and then print it out. 
So there's that virtual and real connection. It's just phenomenal. Um, the, the Oculus I mentioned, the leap motion where your hands can control what's on the screen. We have, we found out early on that you, if you really want your makerspace to develop, you've got to have entry points with people with different skill levels, right? right. If everyone's coming in down here, what, what are you going to do? If, so, someone comes to us and says, I can teach SolidWorks. It's $15,000 a seat, we find out. Well, no, you can get an educational license, put it on a server for $1,000, and get 10 seats. So we have SolidWorks, which is pretty much an industry standard. If you learn SolidWorks, you can go to AutoCAD, you can do Invent. There's a lot of uh, different CAD programs, but you need a higher level CAD than SketchUp and Tinkercad and Blender and Maya. Um, Thingiverse, you know, I don't like to look, we know the problems with Thingiverse. We know the intellectual property issues. We know that we should be posting something that says that we are not responsible when you print out the Batman stuff. Um, and, um, but I hate to make people, I want them aware of it, but you need a starting point. And if it, if it takes that as the gateway drug to get them to designing, I go with it. And I try to encourage them to go to Tinkercad and SketchUp as soon as possible. And the Raspberry Pi, what about that 11 year old girl in California who took a Raspberry Pi and a Hello Kitty balloon and a webcam and was the youngest person to record outer space? for 50 bucks. Isn't that incredible? I mean, it's the cost of these tools and the ease of use that has changed the way we learn. Getting out, donors choose. Do you use donors choose, any of you? Because well, several of our schools have gotten um, printers. Um, our rings in. Oh, we sponsor a robotics team every year. They come to us. We become their fiduciary. It, it's the, they, we handle all their funds. They deposit it. They write checks. They're a little business. So I think that's a great idea because then you have your robots, your, your local robot kids involved. These are all our different entrepreneurs. We've had so many inventions come out of our makerspace. Um, Safe Ride, it's for turning off texting in your car. Um, this guy did a medical. He was working on a stint. I mean, it was, we have to sign non-disclosure agreements. The other day, I had a 13-year-old who's invented this great product. And I said, you know, you really, often I sign a non-disclosure agreement. He goes, really? What is it? And I explain. He comes to me in an hour. He has written a full non-disclosure <laughs> for me to sign. Um, collaborations with the outside. Like this guy, um, he is, they're building a theater. And he designed the whole theater and, and printed out all the parts on the 3D printer to have a model of the 3D printer. Um, a lot of, we had, oh, this incredible group working with the blind. One day I came into the makerspace and a group of Islamic women, Burkut, now, this is not our community. A huge circle in the makerspace with a guy. I turn, it turns out one of them was blind, and they had brought all their Islamic materials to Mickey McCabe, who works when printing for the blind, to see if some of those books could have materials written, um, created for the blind. You, you just don't know the connections that created through, get created through making. Um, this passport to making idea is something for schools, but I could see it in the children's department, something where they are interest centers and different making activities are set up and controlled because it's hard in that environment to manage it. So in a brief nutshell, that's the story of learning and makerspaces. Do you have any questions? Ooh.